Becoming Church, Inclusion. Hear this reading now from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verses 44 through 48. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. May God bless the reading, the hearing, the understanding, the living, and the doing, this God's holy and righteous word to us through Scripture. This passage picks up somewhere in the middle of a longer narrative about a number of people, not the least of whom are Cornelius and Peter, but there are any number of other players. And it reminds us when it reaches just this crescendo that you have heard me read just a moment ago, that the gospel is at its best and that church is nearing its fullness that God intends for it when it is a sign and an expression of crossing boundaries and tearing down walls. The boundaries and the walls that sometimes are natural and the boundaries and the walls that are human contrived, made, and maintained that keep us from right relationship with God and with our neighbor. God in Christ came toward us decisively. And so even though there may have been a gap for whatever reasons, however you come at that doctrinally original sin or what have you, God has moved across the chasm in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to heal the rift. Paul reminds us in his letter to the Ephesians that Christ Jesus has torn down the wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles between them and us, between the circumcised and the uncircumcised. May I say to you that race, ethnicity, religious practice, social location, old enmities and animosities that we have nursed so well over time because we have been so well trained in doing so should never be a barrier to our relationship with God made known in Christ, to the gospel, and to the relationships that can grow out of a gospel-centered and a gospel-focused life. For you see what's at stake, even though I read just a few verses, which is the assigned text for this Sunday, the backdrop is about how this movement called church these followers, these disciples, these people of the way were indeed originally all from the Jewish family or community. And what we learn as the book of Acts unfolds, as the Holy Spirit is vibrant and around, as the risen Christ working through his followers on earth are moving around, more and more what have been perceived and real boundaries and barriers about where such faith would go and to whom it should be addressed are being challenged. If we are to become the people that God intends us to be, we must always have our boundaries challenged, not because they necessarily will fall away or that they have no purpose, but because they need to be tested as to whether or not they are still valid and still valuable or are they something of our own conception and maintenance? Are they things that we have simply done so long? Are they animosities we have nursed so long that we don't even know why we're doing it anymore? In my last local church pastorate, 
It was a small enough community where many of the clergy and people from the churches knew each other well. There was lots of movement between them in the sense of people uh, came to one church, but their spouse or a significant other might be a member or a communicant or participant in one of the other churches. In one of the Roman Catholic churches in that community, the priest there and I became good friends, mostly, mostly because we had so many people out of our respective congregations who had married one another across time, were having children together. And so we would meet most often at weddings, at funerals, at confirmations, and at other such opportunities. On one occasion, Father Jack was in the church that I was serving, a United Methodist Church. And one of the members of the wedding party of the couple that was to be married, obviously a member of my church and the other a member of his parish. He and I, as we were getting ready and putting on our robes, investments, etc., cetera, were talking about the enmity that had existed over time between Roman Catholics and Protestants. Now remember, this is a conversation or a rehearsal of something that went on in the 90s. But Jack was older than I was, and he had been trained in his seminary years in the 50s and in the 60s and was nearing retirement. We looked upon that couple and thought of the cherished love that they had. We knew their parents, both sets of parents. We knew their siblings, and we knew that these people surely belonged together. That day I was presiding over the nuptials and he was to give the homily as his primary role. He really opened up that day and said in the homily, no longer in the sacristy or in my study, he said in the homily, he said, I so much admire the relationship and the love of this young couple toward one another and the way in which their families, one Protestant and one Catholic, have come together around their love and their relationship. He went on, he said, when I was being trained as a young priest, when I was a seminarian, we were still informally being taught that if you see a Protestant come down the street, move to the other side. And then Father Jack really melted the ice that might have been in the room. And he says, now, in the sunset of my years in the practice of ministry, I thought and I think how ridiculous that was and how ridiculous it is and how beneath the gospel such a behavior might ever have been. Now it's one place of enmity it's one place of learned behaviors between Protestants and Catholics. But we can talk about it genderized. We can talk about race and ethnicity. We can talk about socioeconomic status. We have sometimes, sometimes restricted the movements, as if we can, of whom God can love and whom the Holy Spirit can empower based upon our prejudices and our biases. And God in Christ, the risen Christ, set loose in the world in the power of the Holy Spirit will have none of it. Just as was said in John 3, the Spirit blows, <laughs> was said to Nicodemus, where the Spirit wills. How dare we believe that we can restrict the activity of our God in the power of of that God's Holy Spirit at loose, set loose in the world to our tribe, to our theological camp, to our zip code, to our socioeconomic status, to our race, to one gender alone. We too often have prejudged and we seek to restrict and constrict the activity of God's Spirit. On this occasion, when Peter has been called for to look at what's going on in a particular place as people are yearning to participate in the fullness of the gospel, it says that while he was still speaking, the Holy Spirit, doing what the Holy Spirit does, fell upon all who heard the word. Listen to the all. 
And then it says the circumcised believers, that would be the in crowd, the right folks with the right pedigree from the right tribe and the right religious practice and the right zip code who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Peter says, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing from these people who have received the Spirit just as we have? And so he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Peter, who didn't always get it, at least not at first, got it then that this gospel thing, this Holy Spirit thing, this risen Jesus thing was and will always be about crossing boundaries, about tearing down walls, about building bridges, about healing rifts between God and people and between people and people even if they've let religion or its interpretation get in the way of white right relationship. And so I ask of you, dear friends, in the light of the gospel, in the power of the Holy Spirit, looking into the face of the risen Christ, is it not our work to do as church in our own time and place, in our local communities, in our judicatories, in every place where we live our lives to question ourselves as to who are we excluding with no basis in the gospel for said exclusion. Are we those who are willing to step up and sing the hymn that says there is a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness in the sea and there's a kindness in God's justice that is more than liberty. Emphasis on wideness. Or the song that says, there are many gifts, but one spirit. And goes on to intimate through its beautiful lyrics that that spirit is available to all. And all can work and serve in doing the gospel and in being and becoming the church. With God's help, may we so order our lives to be that church that is generous, is kind, compassionate, and radically inclusive, where we do not see barriers to the gospel, to faith, to baptism, and to participation in the life of the church that ultimately is not known by our denominational names, but is the church of Jesus Christ. Amen.